right, good afternoon, everyone, uh, both here in person and online. Uh, our topic for the last session of the day today is practical topics in FRAND licensing with an automotive focus. And the center has put together a fantastic panel to talk about this topic. Uh, fantastic for a lot of reasons, uh, but the one I want to point out here is that each of these panelists, and hopefully we'll see Keith and Igor on the screen behind us in just a second, has researched and written and continues to research and write uh, extensively on all of the topics we're going to write today. Uh, you know, just to give you a little road map, uh, there are four topics we want to discuss with you. It's an ambitious agenda. I, I hope we get to it all. Uh, but the four topics are the evolving nature of essential patent licensing due to changes in the market, including 5G and IoT. A second topic we want to talk about is the emergence of collective licensing action, either pools, uh, licensing platforms, also you know, the newest topic in the area, licensee negotiation groups. Uh, third, we also will cover the value of connectivity in automobiles. And, and like some of the speakers alluded to this morning, when you have a new area with no history in licensing, how do you find the right royalty rates? And, and then fourth, uh, a topic that came up a little bit on the last panel but really didn't get discussed too much is the right licensing level in a multi-level supply chain. Uh, so that's what's on the agenda. The folks who are now with us, who are going to talk about it. First of all, sitting with me, uh, Dr. Bowman Hyden, excuse me. Uh, he's here with us from California, where he's a visiting professor at UC Berkeley. Uh, he's also, let me make sure I get this right, co-director for the Center of Intellectual Property, a visiting scholar at the Hoover Institution at Stanford, in, uh, Stanford University, and also a member of the European Commission's expert group on standard essential patents. So hey, Bo. Yeah, so um, we, we finished up the project with the commission, I think two years at the commission, working on things together with people is enough. You know, when we talk about holdouts, um, we, we talk about uh, how people don't get along, right? So even within, I'm always impressed with standards that people put thousands of people together in a room, come up with a, uh, with a standard that's um, incredibly sophisticated. And uh, because when you put like 15 people together in a room, we can't really agree on it, what we should do, right? I would like to, just quickly, I, I come from the Center for Intellectual Property, that's CIP now. Now here I'm at CIP Squared, so I want to say thanks a lot for coming. But when, I, when I saw CIP Squared, that sounded much better than CIP. <laughs> and so next year, we're coming out with CIP Cubed, <laughs> and we'll be taking you on, Sean. All right. All right. Thanks, Bo. Um, next up, we have Dr. Igor Nikolic, who's here with us uh, on the left side of your screen up above. He is a research fellow at the European University Institute. And Igor, can you say hello? Make sure we hear you. Hello. Thank you for the invitation. Can you hear me? Hey, very good. Loud and clear. Well, thanks for joining us and, and staying up late with us uh, tonight. And then finally, uh, we also have Keith Mallinson. Uh, Keith founded the Wise Harbor Analysis and Consulting Firm back in 2006, and he has more than 25 years of experience in the telecom industry as a research analyst, as a consultant, and also as a testifying expert witness. So Keith, you're with us too. Can you hear us? Yes, I can. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, I guess good, uh, good evening to Igor. Very good. Well, glad y'all are all here together. Uh, I can't see you without turning around very easily, neither can Bo, so make sure you guys speak up if you want to chime in. Otherwise, I, I just don't want to leave you behind. Um, you know, I've looked through, read through, uh, over the last few years, but also in preparation for this panel, a lot of the papers these guys have written, and they've really been the inspiration for the topics and the questions we'll talk about to get today. I just want to highlight a few of those uh, for you in case you'd like to read more after this is over. Uh, the two from Bo that I really want to flag. Uh, first of all, there is a paper that was published in the American Intellectual, Law, uh, Intellectual Property Law Association Journal earlier this year. Uh, 
yep. that deals with a lot of these topics, as well as another paper that's more specifically focused on the auto industry that's available at the 4IP Council website. Both are really, really good. Uh, Igor has a number of forthcoming papers to look forward to on patent pools, on licensing negotiation groups. Uh, and then together, Bo and Igor have uh, st already started working on a book chapter dealing with some of these topics as well. And then finally, uh, Keith has written a number of articles, a series of articles published in RCR Wireless with a really interesting and unique market-based approach to a lot of the topics we'll talk about today uh, that I also highly recommend. Um, I guess also just briefly, uh, like uh, Joshua said earlier, I'm with a company called Avanci. We're a patent licensing platform focused on bringing together all of the standard essential patents for cellular connectivity, uh, putting them in one license, and then making that available for the auto industry. So they have a one-stop, simple solution for licensing. Um, it, you know, it, it, just one reflection uh, in my experience is there has been a lot more interest in SCP licensing in the auto industry than I ever expected when I started this project five years ago. And it really surprised me. I mean, when you look at the numbers, you know, there's roughly 40, 45 million connected cars that will be sold this year. I mean, that is a tiny number when you compare it to the one and a half billion smartphones that are going to be sold. Uh, heck, I mean, it's, it's a fraction of the 200 or 300 million Galaxy smartphones that just Samsung will sell this year. You know, so why is there all the interest? And why are we talking about it at this conference? I mean, in my opinion, it's because the auto industry is on the cutting edge of a couple of things. First of all, they are really the industry leading the way to show the power of the Internet of Things. What can the IoT do? How can it change an industry and, and cause disruption and just transform an industry? And secondly, they are also, outside of the wireless industry, by far the biggest participant, supporter, and embracer of 5G technology. Uh, to the point that 5G is being designed with the auto industry in mind to make sure they have the right tools available to build those new and cool and, and disruptive apps that, that we're all gonna look forward to. So I think for those two reasons, in a lot of ways, you can see the auto industry as really a frontier in essential patent licensing. And you know what we talk about today, it's, it's not just instructive to how to get licenses done with the auto industry for 5G, but I think it's going to be something that we can learn from and instructive for many new industries and many new technologies that are going to get developed in the future as different industries come together. Um, so with that in mind, with that introduction, let's, let's get this started. Uh, I'd like to turn it over to Bo first and, and kind of look back a little bit at what's happened in the past 10 to 15 years. I mean, there's been an increasing interest, interest in essential patent licensing and what FRAND means. And, and I'm curious if you could share with us your thoughts on, on why that's happening. You know, what's been happening in the past that's led us here? Sure. I mean, it's not really a big mystery. I mean, you, you, you talked about it a bit in the context of... Uh, of automobiles, but if we go back, the, the mobile economy is huge. It's over four trillion dollars in the last estimate. I think someone used the term thirteen plus trillion going forward into five G. Um, a lot of value has been created, and all most of the in most of the mobile the mobile economy is is Fran enabled. Often we use the term Fran encumbered, but it's been Fran enabled, right? So all this value has been created through cellular Wi-Fi, Fran enabled standards has generated this huge amount of surplus value. And of course, the reason that uh, SEPs become a um, contentious issue is because there is a lot of value created. If we didn't have a lot of value created through this, there would be nothing to fight over. So the surplus value through the value chain, as we talked about earlier today, um, opens up a lot of uh, discussions. And even though the amount of licensing is very small, I think Alex talked in 2016 about it being around 15 billion in 4G in relation to uh, hundreds of billions or trillions of dollars is a very small percentage. There's still a lot of money for the actors involved, right? And it, and it sits on this precipice of not only um, distributing rents to different actors, but also incentivizing people to participate in a collective system in the first place, which allows the golden goose to produce, or the goose to, to lay the golden egg, so to speak. 
So even though it's not a lot of money in total, it's a lot of money for, for actors, key actors, and it sits at a certain point in the leveraging of this uh, open innovation system. Also, I would say that um, I think Jonathan brought up the idea when, or brought it up about Motorola early on in 2G, starting to create a bit of a fragmentation where not all the telecom actors were uh, vertically integrated. So now you have a large fragmentation of some actors produce certain types of physical products in license, some only produce physical products with no licensing, some only license. So this fragmentation, of course, is creating lots of different interests and lots of different, um, how do you say, uh, opinions on what SEPs in France should be because it's very heterogeneous compared to what it used to be. Yeah, so that's one thing I think people talk about a lot is the surplus, right? I mean, Keith, what, what thoughts do you have on that from the, the market perspective and, and anything you've noticed that have really amplified the, the sort of the fight, so to say, over that surplus value created by standards? Well, as, as uh, Bo has said, um, you know, there is a market value here, and so there's something worth fighting for, and, and certainly that's what we've seen over the years. I, I, initially, um, going back into the 2G era, uh, it was really more oligopolistic in the market with vertically integrated players. Um, and Motorola was actually one of those. Um, but we had, particularly with GSM, we had this kind of club where it um, made it actually difficult for market entrants because of the, uh, the cross-licensing that those guys were doing. Um, but what we've seen since the millennium is a kind of unwinding of this uh, verticalization um, and more of a licensing model. Um, and, and so that important intellectual property value has um, been delivered to the downstream players, um, but they've done it through licensing. Um, and so that's enabled um, the upstream players to, to, to generate some, some, some income. Um, and so what we've seen is, so for example, uh, Qualcomm completely um, uh, de-verticalized from handsets and from infrastructure by around the millennium. And then um, following that, Alcatel 2005, Siemens 2005, Motorola 2012, Ericsson 2011. And, and I think very interestingly, um, Nokia in 2014 um, um, exited the handset business. Those names, some of those names still stick around, but um, through, again, through licensing agreements, they're licensing their brand name. So you can still buy a, a Nokia branded phone. Um, so we've seen a massive um, disruption, um, and um, you know Nokia was had a forty percent market share in the late two thousands. Um, the licensing approach enabled Apple to enter the market in two thousand and seven, and look where that's gone. And, and Igor, I can kind of look to you a little bit. Uh, come and get this from more of a legal perspective. You know, as we see the you know, uh, the battle for the surplus. Is that something you see as rational market behavior or, or something that's uh, a problem that needs to be addressed? Uh, thank you. Well, if you, if you ask me the battle over the surplus, it uh, always was and always will be. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, how it should be addressed. So if we have a friend commitment in place and we see that friend commitment has functioned already in the telecommunication industry, it, uh, the litigation we had actually is just a fragment of many, many licenses that were concluded without litigation. And the vast majority of cases that were litigated were in the end settled. I think there was a study a couple of years ago that did uh, cases, SAP cases in the US. And I think the number was more than 90 that was settled before, before judgment. So uh, I think what in the IoT and in the car, car sector, we need to look how France system can be further enhanced, further improved, and then see how to ensure the more efficient licensing but I'm not sure that there is a need for radical change of the system. And I think we see kids, kids slide. Here's a slider. Ah, excellent. So Keith, maybe we can jump back to uh, your point earlier. Yes. 
So, um, I mean, this really plays on to what Alex Gelfovich was talking about earlier, where he was showing the proportion of um, li the, the, the licensing revenues and how they were tracking. And what he'd not shown is the last few years. I think it, it's worth looking at this overall trend that shows that what we've seen is that the licensing revenues have actually declined for the major players over recent years. So this really refutes the notion of stacking with the players um, on top of each other, but also the layering on of new standards of technology. So one of the arguments, one of the kind of stacking arguments is that when you layer 3G onto 2G and 4G onto 3G and 5G onto 4G, that the, the, the aggregate licensing um, payments will, will, will increase. That has not happened. Um, and interestingly, if you look at the different players, the only one that has managed to increase its licensing income um, significantly over this period of time among these players is actually Nokia. And as I said earlier, they had a market share of 40% um, in the late 2000s. And their licensing approach was really more of a kind of defensive one to minimize their out payments of, of licensing fees um, for all the other SEPs that they were needing to, to, to use to implement. And when they sold the handset business, um, they um, were looking to change their business model, if you like. In fact, I, I was retained by a, a hedge fund around about 2014, asked the question to what extent and how rapidly could they unwind their, their uh, um, licensing approach to increase their royalties. Well, this shows that even as they have shed the handset division, their ability to be able to increase royalties has been modest. Um, it, they've doubled, but it's still small potatoes in comparison to the hundreds of billions of dollars in handsets. So Keith, the follow-up question for you and, and anyone else uh, about the slide you're showing here. W with the decreasing rates over the last few years, I mean, what other, I mean, do we think that's a good thing, a, a bad thing? We always talk about Frand needing to get the balance right to allow widespread use of the technology, but still uh, motivate further and future innovation. Um, I mean, is this a good trend, a, a trend you'd like to see reversed? What's, what's your position on that? Well, I, I, I certainly think that the scaremongering about um, stacking in exorbitant royalties is, is misplaced. Um, so um, for, the, for the value that's being delivered downstream, um, I think it's clear that things are, 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 are in a good state or improving for the downstream players. For the upstream players, then I think then it's, it's bad news because of the additional investments that they've been making and would like to make further investments as the marketplace expands um, to serve. I mean, with 4G, it was still mainly about personal communications. It's about um, voice and data um, on smartphones in particular. With IoT, then there are a plethora of new opportunities. We've got the beginnings of 5G, but there's still a lot more that can be done. And I think it's well justifies the, uh, it, it, the um, additional royalties would be well justified for the value that's going to be, that can be bestowed downstream as the mobile technologies with 5G and 6G in time will transform radically the, the way things communicate um, uh, as, as a next major wave of, of, of change um, and additional value in the overall industrial ecosystem. Yeah. Like Bill, yeah. Yeah, I was gonna, I mean, we, it's interesting because I think the work that Alex and Lou and Steve did was pretty straightforward. I mean, even without needing a lot of interpretation, they measured empirically how much money people spent and they measured it against the amount of value that was created. And the number was much lower than what everyone said. But their, their focus was to say there isn't royalty stacking, there isn't holdup. But the, the question that people haven't really asked 
so much in that way as, well, is it so low that it's hold out? Or we start to ask that, right? And, you know, um, as was said earlier by Jeff, you know, it's one thing to be worried about hold out, hold up, sorry, so you put the fence at the cliff. But now we have evidence, possibly, that there are people falling over the cliff on another thing, yet even with that evidence, we're not necessarily doing anything. So if we're going to be preemptive on one hand, we should at least do something based on empirical evidence on the other hand. That would seem reasonable. So, Igor, I'm curious to get your uh, opinion on this and, and also uh, a little bit about how the emergence of the Internet of Things is really going to impact, you know, that, that chart that Keith just showed, but, but essential patent licensing practices in the future. Uh, yes, thank you. Well, the impact in the, uh, with the IoT will be different than what we have seen uh, in the telecoms industry uh, because at the, well, at the moment, so we have seen uh, the SCPs are implemented in uh, relatively few objects like smartphones, tablets, personal computers, and they have been used by a relatively no number of market players. Uh, many of them are vertically integrated, some are not, as we have now discussed. But uh, with the IoT, we'll have many new in industries and many new objects using standards. So as we are going to discuss connected cars, obviously then other industries, healthcare devices, consumer devices, smart homes, uh, manufacturing equipment, Everybody is expecting that new industries and new devices will use connectivity standard 4G, 5G in the future. So we're going to see many new companies needing to take a license. And the difference is that they're coming from different uh, licensing culture, so may have different views what they think should pay for SCPs. They may have uh, no corresponding SCP for portfolio for cross-licensing. And I think the challenges with IoT is how do we efficiently manage the vast majority of new implementers, new users? How do we value the standards in different uses, uses? And how do we approach different licensing traditions? So do we just apply what we have learned in the telecom sector to the new new industries, or we try to blend different approaches and try to arrive to some, some new solutions. Keith, I know you've written on this a couple of times. What would you add to this, this sort of prediction about how the IoT is changing things? Well, I mean, it's, it's changing. Um, it's a radical change. It will take some time to occur. In fact, with 5G initially, actually, interestingly, 5G has been, in a way, kind of more of the same that we had with mobile broadband with, uh, with 4G. Um, but what is often forgotten is that uh, a G is a whole generation, takes 10 years, and it's a process um, and goes through several iterations. Um, there's normally a new standards release every year or two. And as these new um, improvements come, then it's further enhancing the capabilities to really radically um, improve and change the way we do things. So for example, as well as just having faster connections, we're having very low latency connection capabilities, which may be vital for some kind of industrial applications. So in terms of the marketplace, we've got a lot of additional capabilities and the developer community, the downstream side of implementation has a lot of work to do. And that, as that plays through, that will do, deliver an enormous amount of value. From a licensing point of view, it creates some challenges because whereas with the previous generations of cellular, it was mainly just about handsets. That was relatively straightforward. Um, there was a kind of consensus in the industry, in fact, a desire from the downstream side of the, the, the industry that licensing should be done, for example, on a percentage basis of the handset value. And the reason for that was the handset vendors um, were um, set to um, produce cheaper handsets lower cost and with competition prices going down and 
the um, the handset um, vendors would not want to have to pay a fixed royalty fee. Um, and so it was actually the, the downstream implementers that wanted a percentage-based approach, um, actually until with the advent of smartphones, the average selling price is starting to go back, go, to go back up again, which is why in recent years we've seen royalty caps um, and they've been demanded by the, the downstream side of the business. With IoT, then it's a lot more complicated um, because we have um, many different applications, many different vertical sectors. And so a one size fits all approach is probably not going to work. It won't work um, in terms of the way the licensing is, is carried out. Um, and so far, it seems to be showing mostly that there's going to be more of a kind of dollar per unit or DPU based licensing approach that's going to apply in IoT. But, but even so, different IoT applications are going to have rather different values. So one extreme example, what I call the IoT light bulb. Um, if you were going to put 5G in a light bulb, you, um, it, would need, it wouldn't be viable unless it was um, a pretty low um, royalty charge for that. In contrast to that, uh, an autonomous vehicle, a self-driving car, um, or a piece of uh, medical equipment, complex medical equipment, would be deriving a lot more value. And so the pricing, um, the pricing model is going to be rather different. The distribution model for getting those licenses into the marketplace may need to be different, is likely to be different as well. Whereas a lot of bilateral licensing occurred in, in um, handsets, mobile handsets, it makes sense that there are other broader licensing platform approaches such as uh, Avanci. Yeah, I could add a little bit. Let me, let me be optimistic. Um, I think that uh, there's a real opportunity. There's a window of opportunity now as we move into 5G. And, and it's good to, to, to get there ahead of time. I think once people start to ship products and they start to accumulate past damages, let's call them that, it becomes more difficult to negotiate. But in this window of opportunity before a lot of 5G starts to go out the door in the context of IoT and because it's gonna grow into a huge, even bigger market, it's this discontinuous moment, this Harry Seldon moment for you foundation fans where you have this opportunity now to, just like with 3G, this is gonna be a huge value creation. Value is gonna, opportunities for a lot of actors, and with, with this ability to negotiate and discuss with people and set the terms ahead of time, this, this allows for different models to form. So just the fact of Avanci forming, you didn't see that type of gr groups of actors form in the past. You see the people coming up with new models. So because it's so complicated and there's gonna be so many products out there and so many verticals, People have to shift to a different mode of thinking, and this gives opportunities for new things to come about and eliminate some of the old problems. That's my, at least my optimistic take on this. Yeah. Well, kind of following up on that, and a topic we heard a few times throughout the day today is big companies versus small companies, right? Mm -hmm. Scott alluded to it at lunch. I think it came up this morning in the DOJ's remarks. With big companies, that's where most of these cases we talk about, right. right, come when two really large companies are in a lawsuit over millions or billions of dollars. You know, as we get to the IoT, and, and Igor made this point, it's going to be a whole lot of new companies and new industries entering the market. And they, you know, auto industry isn't a great example because they're also, for the most part, very large companies. Right. And even the small startup companies are more valuable than all the really big companies. But what's going to happen when it's not uh, a company with a team for patent licensing? Heck, they may not even have an in-house legal department, right. but they need to get these licenses in place. How is that aspect that we have a lot of new and, and perhaps really small licensees that need access to the technology? What, what's the practical solution there? Uh, open it up to anyone. I mean, I can just say quickly that I. I I mean, this is a good opportunity to expand. These small companies, you want to grow to be big, right? When they're small, they're not very, they're not creating a lot of value for themselves or for the SCP holders. 
So there's an incentive for them to grow. In fact, in the tech space, it's interesting because in the European Commission, just as the US, we were worried about SMEs. But in the tech industry, you're not an SME for very long if you're successful, right? I think Spotify was an SME for like about 12 seconds. <laughs> And then it was way beyond. So when company, if, you, if you're like a long time technology SME, it's not going well, right? So you want to support people that will then grow, and then it will be obvious that they should take a license. Maybe it's not in, in, in while they're, when they're in a young phase, maybe that's the time to start to teach that this is if you're to acclimate themselves with the concept of SEPs. It's, it is a teaching or learning, I think, process, which, which will take some effort. And in fact, the commission, that's something that I recommended the commission. That's one positive thing that they could do. Yeah. Igor, Keith, anything you'd add on that, on this idea of the small companies coming in the IoT? Yeah, well, I, I would say, I mean, the wonderful thing about standards is that they are published, uh, they're widely, widely and freely available. I don't mean gratis, um, but um, it's, it's easy to access them. And so that lowers the barriers to entry for, for new entrant implementers. So they can just get cracking and they, they can do that. In terms of licensing, then I think it's down to the licensors or the SEP owners, how they want to do it. If they have the size and the inclination and they want to do bilateral license, licensing, they can and should be able to do that. Um, however, that may not be what all the licensors want to do, particularly when there are so many industry verticals, so many different applications. So many of them, as has been shown to be the case in the automotive industry with Avanci, have decided that they'd like to use a third party, a platform, as their means of going to market with their licensing proposition. Um, so, it can ha happen either way. And in fact, it should, um, for antitrust reasons, it should be possible always that it can be done both ways. Um, if there is a pooling approach um, for the, um, the business review clearance, it's generally a condition that bilateral licensing should also be allowed. But it's really, it's down to the licensor side to decide how they want to reach those people. I mean, if you don't get a call as a licensee, as we heard earlier, you know, some, one of the questions earlier was, you know, I'm an implementer, I want a license. Um, you know, what should I do? Should I panic? And then the answer was, was, was no. If, 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 if you're not, if no one's asking you for a license um, and you're a component manufacturer, for example, then you can just, you can just get going. And, and even if you're implementing a downstream product, um, it's ultimately the onus of the licensors to come to you to tell, to tell you how they would like to, 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 to license. I mean, it doesn't stop you going to Avanci because you know Avanci or, or whomever exists and say, well, I know you're a, some kind of pool or platform. Um, I'd like to, to just proactively come and take a license from you. And if I may add, uh, so in Europe, with the discussion about SMEs, uh, there is always the fear that uh, now with 5G, with SMEs, there will be the big EVO SAP owners coming to get SMEs to sue them, ask for injunctions, ask for excessive royalties. But uh, I don't think uh, that's actually has a basis in, in reality because how much an SME's license is worth? So the SAP owner has transaction and negotiation costs to approach SME, identify, negotiate the license. So that's so cost. And maybe the question we need to ask, is it actually worthwhile or how big company should be until it becomes worthwhile to license it? So that's kind of a, a threshold question. And I think as both, both said, many small companies that have small production quantities and have actually small value, it may not happen to be worthwhile to license bilaterally. And that's why I think in the future, what uh, SAP owners could do is to have more licensing platforms or pool licensing to make licensing as easy as possible for SAP owners to know at one place 
how much they should pay and already have a template licenses available. So that can really cut the costs and increase the knowledge to SMEs about how do they get the license and how much they should pay. You could, you could argue that SMEs are indemnified against royalties below the level of the transaction cost it takes to license to them. Econ uh, you know, economically, not legally, maybe. I guess you're right, but I think there may also be a fear on their side that one lawsuit on an SCP, they, they couldn't you know, run and hire uh, the, the type of law firm you need to defend that case. And that single case may put them out of business. So even though the chances are low, maybe the consequences are, are high. No, no, I think that that's... Not well, at least I, I think that that's a perception. Whether that's a reality, I don't know, but a perception in, in this world, perception matters, right? Yeah, for so sure. So they should at least be put at ease, or there should be some mechanism that they can interface with. And I mean, there's lots of very smart lawyers that they, can ha that they could hire to handle that situation. Yeah. All right, so turning back to the, the, the focus of the, the panel a little bit as we wrap up this last topic, you know, the auto industry has pretty loudly joined the debate on essential patents in the last few years. Um, just to kind of set up the rest of the discussion today, I'm, I'm curious to get each of your opinions on you know, why that is and, and what, if anything, is notable about it. Uh, so I'm not sure who wants to go first, but uh, let's, let's focus on the auto industry for a minute. You want to go first, guys? I, I'll, I'll, I'll pitch in. First of all, I think what you just said, Luke, is an understatement. <laughs> certainly from, uh, from the point of view of some of the auto manufacturers. Um, I mean, the thing is, it's a, a bit of a kind of shift in the way of doing business for the automotive industry. They, they, they're not accustomed to, to having to pay license fees to external parties. Um, and, and so it's a disruption. Um, but they have a technological disruption that's occurring, which I think is actually a, potentially a very beneficial one for them, um, in that as this new technology is being in, injected into vehicles, um, they have an opportunity to generate more value and more business for themselves. I mean, they have a disruption that's being forced on them, in a sense, with the need to move away from uh, hydrocarbons to the electric powertrain, um, I think there will be, for example, increasing pressure to improve um, safety. Um, there's still millions of people who die on the roads each year. Um, so um, I, I, the, the technologies, auto, uh, autonomous driving technologies, safety features and such like, have the ability to save a lot of lives. So I think it's all um, good news. Um, um, and good opportunity for the entire ecosystem and for consumer welfare overall. Certainly, you know, the, um, uh, with reducing accidents and saving lives. Yeah, I can, I can jump in. Yeah, so connectivity, as you said, uh, Keith, is one of the key mega trends, right? You have electrification, you have automation, you have shared uh, ride sharing. Um, Almost every when I would, when I did my study on connected cars, I, I read all the automotive uh, annual reports. It's uh, they all talk about connectivity as a huge thing. Every single one, I think Toyota had four pages in their annual report on the importance of connectivity. Um, if I just quote uh, Herbert Dice, I have this here. Um, he's the chairman and CEO of uh, VW. His letter to shareholders and the latest one said. Making our, this is his quote, it's up on the website as his main thing when you go to the annual report. Making our core product, the car, the most important internet device of the future is our big opportunity. Now, I don't understand how you can have that type of top level discussion on this and be held up over the licensing of what's mostly the SCPs that you need for this. So it seems that there's a bit of an incongruity between the discussion about the SCP level of licensing and the cost, the price, and this huge uh, understanding that this is, a, this is a major shift for the whole industry, right? And for me, the only thing that explains it is not the price, $15. It can't be 15 or 20 or whatever number that's, you know, the, that you spend when you do a park, pay to park one day. 
It has to be the fact that they're concerned that this will change the norms in their industry. They're, so, they're on the top of the pyramid in their industry. They have a certain set of norms about how the tier suppliers operate, and we talked about this at lunch, and they're worried that, that this will start an avalanche of changing of the norms, which they, which they enjoy. But now you have this convergence of norms, and either one is going to win or they're going to merge into something new. These are your only choices, really. Yeah. And, and when you talk about norms, just to follow up on that point, you mean norms for how they handle IP in their industry, their relationship yeah. with their suppliers? It, what it, sort of specifics? Yeah, that's what I mean. I mean, the nature on how they do procurement. I mean, typically they, they do procurement and IP is handled by their suppliers and that they don't necessarily worry with these issues themselves. But this is, of course, a different context. And when you go to telecom, you have the opposite. Everyone knows that that's how you do it. So you have this convergence of norms, right? And that's what you have. You're going to have the same thing in, in electrification, possibly, and automation. There are going to be different norms coming together. And this is what we have. And then we're going to, it's going to be a bit of a struggle, as people would like to keep their norms. And we'll see what happens from there. But it's not insurmountable. It's just that if you had never done this and you're used to getting your way, that people are going to be stubborn, right? So it's going to take some time. Yeah. Uh, Igor, what would you add on the auto industry's sort of entrance in, into this debate? Uh, I'll just to add what uh, Bo mentioned and what I mentioned at the beginning. So we are seeing a clash between different uh, licensing uh, cultures or traditions. And that's the key, the key problem. So as Bo mentioned, the, the tradition or the custom in the car industry is to procure all your parts free of IP rights. And uh, a car manufacturer obtains a component without uh, clear of IP rights and uh, with uh, indemnity clauses. So if it has to pay for IP, it can be identified by its suppliers. In the telecoms industry, as we know, it's different. A licensing is done uh, at the end device level because of the efficiencies in, in, in that uh, industry. And now is the question, how do we find a solution that uh, on the one hand keeps the value of the technology and the SAPs are priced appropriately in the car sector, but at the same time, how do we mend it with already existing industry practice, supplier agreements, indemnity clauses? So I think that's the challenge, how to overcome, overcome that. Well, perfect. I mean, I think that's the right setup and, and the right background as we talk about the next three topics. You know, the, the joint licensing in the auto industry, uh, the valuation of, of the essential patents for the auto industry, and, and if we get to it, the licensing level. Um, but before we do that, I, I'm told I need to make an announcement for those attending virtually for their CLE credit. Uh, I'm noticing a trend here. It seems like the, all the codes are going to be uh, uh, historic, iconic uh, phones of the past. Here we go. The panel four CLE password is Razor, spelled the Motorola way, R-A-Z-R. -R. So no O. That's R is in Romeo, A is in Alpha, Z is in Zulu, R is in Romeo. Uh, a conference organizer will also add this into the Zoom chat shortly. So, so thanks for bearing with me through that. And how are you guys doing out there? Because when Luke said we're, we're going to segue into the next three topics, I saw a big excitement in your eyes <laughs> over the mass. So that's good to see. Yeah, looks good. 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 <laughs> looks good. We got to <laughs> chuckle. I'll take it. Um, so let's talk about joint licensing. And, and Keith, I, I mean, the. The, the sort of start of this was the patent pools, specifically the, you know, the MPEG patent pool is kind of the modern patent pool that started it all. If you could just give us an introduction, since I know this is something you've studied and wrote on before, you know, patent pools have had mixed results, you know, but when they work, uh, what problems can they solve? Let's get started there. I, I, um... They have had mixed results. In some places, they've worked extremely well. In, in other places, they've gotten no traction. So for example, in, in cellular with LTE, there are pools put together, several pools, and um, they really weren't any takers. It's crucial for a pool that there's a kind of critical mass of licensors that, that come on board. And um, that didn't happen um, with uh, LTE for handsets. Um, uh, and the 3G pool wasn't too good either. Um, it worked pretty well 
I would say with the video codex, um, certainly MPEG-2 and MPEG-4. Um, uh, um, and the reason for that is I think it's because there was a, a kind of common interest across the ecosystem. Um, it's notable that in the case of um, those video pools that you've got um, a lot of licensors who are also significantly needing to in-license patents from others. Um, and um, I think that that made it, made it work quite well. It also had an effect on, on rates. Um, certainly the, um, the, the, the rate for MPEG-4, that's uh, ABCH2, um, um, advanced video uh, coding, the, the rate was really only about 20 cents per, uh, per device, uh, per, 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 per license. I mean, it, very, it was quite a complex structure, but it pretty much maxed out at that level. So even though you got a lot of, it was, if you, in a sense, dominated by licensors, they were actually ones that had a very strong interest in um, keeping the, the rates at a, at a moderate level uh, because they were uh, having to effectively compensate other, other um, license, uh, licensee, licensors, sorry. Um, and, and so that balance is, is, has been a kind of positive effect um, in, in making those, those kinds of pools work. Um, and I think we're moving into a different era and now, and with your pool or your platform being an example where um, it's, it's um, you've got um, many licensors, they own the intellectual property and they're licensing into another sector. So it's, it's not the same parties that are both licensor and licensee. Um, and early signs uh, are that um, that is an appealing model. Um, it's obviously still only early days yet. It will be interesting to see how that advancy type model will work in other uh, vertical sectors for other applications in IoT. But certainly one of the crucial reasons why it's uh, pooling is, is, is desirable is transaction costs. You've got in if, if bilateral licensing had worked quite well in the confines of the cellular sector, a limited number of licensors and a reasonably limited number of licensees. But the matrix just expands now, certainly on the licensee side, um, and it just becomes unwieldy and inefficient um, to, for, for a lot of licensors to be licensing bilaterally everybody. Now, some of the large licensors may decide they still want to do quite an extensive amount of bilateral licensing, and that's their prerogative. But I think for, for many licensors, it's really just not going to make sense. And from the point of view of licensees, it will be a relief to be able to go to something akin to a one-stop shop or a few one-stop shops, two, two or three stops, to be able to get the, the clearance that they need. Um, uh, that... that, that Sounds like music to my ears for obvious reasons. The, um, you know, it, but pools, like we said, they're well known, right? It's something, there's recipes or formulas about how to make a compliant pool. Uh, you know, the DOJ Europe has their guidelines as well. Bo, the new kid on the block is the licensee negotiation group, which as far as I can tell, came up into the discussion for the first time in your expert group. Uh, at least that's the first time I heard of it or read about it. You know, what's the idea? What's the motivation behind a licensee negotiation group? And how are they the same or different from pools and, and licensing platforms? I mean, how do they compare? Yeah, that's a good question. We don't really know yet, do we? We're kind of... How could they be? We're talking them into existence exactly. in these days, right? Yeah. So it's a good time to have a, a chat about them and maybe think about what they could be and, and what could be good and bad, and, and possibly to eliminate the bad side of them. So I think, um, I mean, LNG for me, the way that I think about it, and the way it was discussed in our expert group, is it's more like a collective bargaining organization in a way. So the different uh, implementers can come together, and 
I'm always, uh, it's always interesting because people come up and I think that it comes again from this patent hold up perspective. Even though I think earlier today we said, why don't we put the fence, you know, in front of the canyon? Okay, well that was Frand. And then, and then we had um, eBay, that was the wall. And then we had the Google FTC, the, that was the moat with the alligators. And so, but yet we have, so we have the moat, we have the wall and we have the fence. And yet we still start out everything with, SCP owners have all this power, we have hold up. I'm like, okay, well, this is like a time capsule back to the 90s, what, what's the deal here? But uh, so with, with LNGs, the idea is usually put forward because we have this power, this hold up issue, wouldn't it be good to let the, the, license, the licensees work together collectively to balance that power? Now, ironically, I say that, well, there isn't that power to worry about, but um, if they do get together, maybe this offers an opportunity to solve hold out, right? Because if everyone got together on one side and they were all bound to an agreement that they, that they um, part of this collection in the same way that in patent pools, people would be bound to license their patent if they're part of the pool. And a negotiation could be struck between a lot of implementers at the same time and possibly another pool, patent pool on the other side, then this would start to become something that you would think about as a platform. And I know you guys at Avanci, you consider yourselves a platform where you're trying to get, get all the implementers and all the uh, SCP holders to kind of agree on a price where they would all participate, right? So for me, the LNG is just the one side. Now you can go around and talk to everyone. I know Rude Peters did that in one blue. He kind of did it by himself. But if they all got together, that would, um, that would also solve the problem. Now if, it, uh, it, if the price here is too low for the, uh, for the SCP holders, then they can just walk away from it. There's no mandate. So you're just back to where you started from again. And if I think that actually, um, so, but if there was a strike a deal, then it would, you would get a lot more people to pay a license based on that. So that could be possibly solving a holdout issue. And the third instance is likely what happens with pools, as we just discussed, is that people defect, right? So the problem with creating pools is that not everyone wants to be in the pool because they have different incentives. Not everyone's gonna to want to be in the LNG either and agree. So I would think that ironically, why it make people worry that this will be a cartel of some type, I think they will have the same defection issues as it is on the other side. But again, if it falls apart, then we're just back to where we are. When people say, well, we don't want them to be a cartel to sustain holdout, I say, well, you don't need an LNG to manage that problem. I, th I think that uh, they pretty much are able to handle that as it is, as Scott told us at lunch today. So. <laughs> Well, it, it's funny you say that, right? The idea, is it a cartel? Is it legal or not? Right. I mean, I've, I've read and heard people say that, you know, if you set up an LNG, uh, it, it could either be useless or illegal, but it's going to be one of the two. <laughs> I, I'm curious, you know, Igor, you've looked at this a lot from the legal side. You know, what are the restrictions? How do you make an LNG that is neither useless nor illegal? <laughs> is it possible? Uh that that's a million dollar question so i don't know we don't know yet so and we have a lot of discussions about lngs but we don't know if and how should they work so what we do have is commission's uh uh scp expert group proposal and in that proposal how how i read it or is that uh members of the lng should internally agree on the license product, on the level of the value chain to license, and the maximum amount of, of royalty they would they would accept. And what I have written and 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 raised the issue with that is so how do you implement it? We will have all the members sit on a table and just talk about pricing, their licensing, their costs, what should be the maximum price they would accept. And obviously that is a cartel in EU competition rules, that's breach of competition by object, probably per se rules in, in the US. So that kind of way, obviously, it sounds is like there's competitive. Igor, it sounds like there's a, a, a dark, smoky room when those conversations are <laughs> Yeah, yes, yeah. <laughs> but this would be plain in the open. So that, that, that that's kind of the proposal. So we need, to, we need to be very mindful of the competition rules. And what also interests me is the difference between patent pools on the one hand, and LNGs. So with patent pools, yes, we do have 
competitors on the upstream market. They are competitors between themselves, but they are uh, aggregating complementary assets, complementary patents. And actually, when you have complementary assets together in a pool, the price is lower than with, when it is priced individually. So actually, it's pro-competitive. And the European Commission, also the Department of Justice, FTC, they promote patent pools. And they have also given guidelines under which condition patent pools are blocked, exempted, or under safe harbor. But with LNGs, we have direct competitors. And we need to be mindful of the market share. So we have, so I see a paradox. On the one hand, we want to have a platform, a big LNG platform, which can take a license for all its members. On the one hand, that's noble. But on the other hand, that creates a big market power. And then we have maybe monopsony problem. So in order to have successful LNG, we need to have many implementers. But then if we have maybe 80% of the market in the LNG, how does that relate to the increased market power? And then that's something that, that is also concerning, the increased market power on the selling side. And how do you square those paradoxes? I'm not sure yet. Thanks, Igor. I, can, I can't say anything against you because we're writing this chapter together. So I, I agree with you. <laughs> and um, so I, I, there is a bit of an analogy. Like you said, you have the complementary. Obviously, the patent pool people have patents. The complementary patents, the LNG people are, are buyers. They're not contributing certain property rights. Um, I think one thing to pull back from so that we're, we try to be creative in a positive way is to acknowledge, and I think this happens negatively more on, on the side of people focusing on holdup and other antitrust issues regarding SEPs, but is that the whole ecosystem is very collective to begin with, right? I mean, the whole standard development organization is a collective activity. So standards, FRAN-based or SEP-based, FRAN-based standards start out or born very collectively. People come together, contribute technology, especially now in cellular and 4G and 5G, it's one standard. They used to have competing standards, now it's one. We're all together in one big collective group. When we say FRAN, we're already saying that we're gonna license on fair and non-reasonable terms, which means that the concept that comes next can't be looked at from an antitrust perspective as if it's just the market and the, the hierarchy because it's all been created in a collective way to begin with. So how, how much collective can we be? How much? So definitely the idea of pools or platforms doesn't fall outside of the, this overall concept that we've created this whole thing very collectively in the first place. So what you don't want to do is just have a knee-jerk, classical 20th century antitrust thinking for this. You have to bring it in and see what would work, what would be possible, what could go wrong, how do we stop that from happening? You know, be rational, which I know is a tricky thing to ask for. But uh, yeah, let's try it. Yeah, well, any predictions? I mean, you, Keith, Igor, anyone on will these really be implemented and, and how could they be implemented in a useful and good way? What do you say, Igor? Uh, licensing negotiation groups, how to implement them. Uh, okay. well, we'll see in the book chat. Have you seen the book chapter that we are writing? <laughs> you need to buy the book. That's the answer. I think that if that's they, also yeah. not <laughs> exactly if you buy the book, right? I mean, basically, like you said in the beginning, you said that they're either useless or illegal. Well, they're probably my my economic. I took the legal side out. They're either useless or useful. Um, and if they're useful, that's good. And if they're useless, no harm. And I don't know, Keith, any, any opinion from you? I, I think I'd like to just endorse what I've, what I've heard. I, the concerns, um, I mean, it, to me, they smell like buyer's cartels. And, and clearly, all the evidence shows, even though they get dispersions, that you, know, you get the kind of um, uh, the whole collective hold up through, through a pool of um, licensors. As Igor said, what happens is you actually get a lower rate in a pool than typically than you, would, than you will with bilateral licensing. So that argument doesn't fly. And because uh, as Igor also said, it's it, um, their compliments. So 
I think the, the, the patent pooling approach with the, um, the, 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 the um, kind of conditions that are, are, are put in with that have, have worked fine. I'm very troubled at the thought of the, uh, the um, licensing negotiation groups. I think maybe the, the, I think it's important that the licensees have a voice and they have some means of being able to communicate, to be able to be educated and to be able to communicate their views to the licensor community. And maybe that's through some kind of neutral or independent middle party um, rather than, and in a sense, as I said, the successful pools before have been, they've been, I'd say, run, uh, instigated by licensors, but those that have significant downstream interests. We need to find a way of getting the downstream in interests represented in the process of, of, of um, the, the, the license, putting the licensing um, schemes together, including pricing. But um, for them to do it as, as a sort of separate uh, cartel, I think, is, is, is worrying. And um, I hope that doesn't happen. You see, when you use the word cartel, it doesn't sound good, does it? It's use of terms, right? No, but I, I, I mean, I, I have the same concerns that Keith does. I, I just think if we go back to hold up and hold out as concepts, we had a def, what's the definition? We talked about that earlier today. Um, for me, I, through my research, the thing that comes to mind that's the key is compulsion. You have to be, you have to, there has to be a compulsion for you to pay or not be paid. That's the key. So if you say you offer someone a price that's high and they can say no, that's not that's not hold up, right? So um, so as long as this is set up in a way that that the holdout is not you have to accept a lower rate, you, you're compulsed to do that, then it won't be a problem. So we have to avoid that. I do have this one I, this one thing in the back of my mind that that I want to see, even though it's a bit funny. Um, I want to see DG Comp institute a buyer's cartel as an antitrust remedy. I, just for that, that has to be historic, right? <laughs> so part of me wants to see that just for that, but maybe that's not a good enough reason. I, I, I think I always tell my kids, two wrongs don't make a right. Is, is that what you're <laughs> suggesting right now, Bo? Have I been wrong this whole time? Yeah, that's, uh, I, I'm, if uh, it, it would just seem so ironic to do it that way, that would just bust the whole thing open. So I think you can be assured that, that that's a little too radical. All right. One it, thing that would be worse would be DG Comp just to simply set the price, wouldn't it? Uh, what was that? Sorry, Keith. He wants DG Comp. One thing that price. would be worse would be to, for DG Comp to just do price regulation, sure. to just decide what the price should be. Exactly right. So you know when we're when we're uh, so we're still doing private ordering. What's worse is if the government would mandate something. As soon as the government mandates, it's funny. Just quickly, sorry. No, this is great. When you when you man if if the industry creates a patent pool, so the patent pool or any type of pool, if it's if it's decided by industry, it's private. When it's done in a private ordering way, it's positive in my mind. When it's mandated by the government, it's negative, even though it's the same concept. So if the government says you have to have a patent pool versus we'll allow companies, to, the industry to decide, those are two completely different things because when the government mandates a patent pool, you will automatically eventually get to, to price setting because someone has to set the price. So it's funny how the same concept is completely different depending on the, whether it's a private or public ordering mechanism that creates it. And for me, as long as LNGs remain in the, in the realm of private ordering, People can walk away. It's not a problem. That they were man it's once, once the government uses the word mandate. So if you look in our expert group report, some things are like the commission should suggest or should allow. When anytime people are suggesting or allowing market actors to do something, for me that's good. Whenever it's mandate or use that word, then I get very nervous because it turns into price setting, you know, basically, even if that's not what you intended in the first place. Sorry, Keith, you, 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 you triggered me, Keith. I appreciate that. So any parting shots on collective licensing, like Keith, Igor? I guess not. So, so Keith, your comment about D 
DG comp setting prices is actually a pretty good segue to the next topic because I'm going to ask the three of you to set prices. What's, what's the right way to find the royalty rate for licensing SEPs in the auto industry? I mean, this is an example of what we talked about this morning, sort of a green space where there hasn't been decades of licensing, where there's been price discovery, where there's a history of comparable agreements that you can look to to set royalty rates. So when you have this new space, which is going to happen again and again as the IoT develops and new technologies and new industries become connected, you know, what are the tools for finding the right royalty rate? You know, we can talk about the tools, we can talk about the specific context of the auto industry, uh, but you know, I know this is something, especially you, Bo and Keith, have both written about quite a bit. Um, you know, kind of, what's your take on this? How do we find a way forward? I was, uh, Luke. I was just going to say fifteen dollars for four G. Just be done with it. I appreciate the I appreciate the plug. I appreciate the plug for if sure. If anyone doesn't know, that's that's um, Avance's four uh, G uh, rate per car. Uh, but it's yeah, with a with a new marketplace, it's it's always um, a tricky thing. Um, you know, if, if if you have established comps, then that is a market rate, and then others can follow it. But at some point, with any anything new, then something has to be established. Um, I think you can actually look at the cellular uh, mobile handset licensing side of things to get some kind of feel of what the value is for uh, licensing in a, in a car. Um, uh, that's that's one one approach. Um, I think it's it's a fairly kind of conservative approach. Um, so with handsets, it, the licensing originally was on a percentage basis of the handset price. Uh, as I said, it sort of morphed into something that's getting closer to a dollar per unit um, basis because licensing agreements increasingly have had uh, both caps and floors to them, which means you've only got the percentage rate in between. So you can come up with a dollar figure and you consider the value that you've got through your ability to stream video and and to, to make calls and, and have enhanced navigation and such like. And so some of that can be applied over to the automotive side. Um, clearly some implementations of cars are very austere, e-call. E uh, I know Avancy has a, a lower rate for, for that where it's literally just an emergency call. Um, but for if you, if you think of it, in some respects, you could say that maybe you're getting more value in a handset um, in some respects, you can say you get more value in a car because you may have multiple um, users, multiple people um, hotspotting or and kids in the back watching, several of them watching the same material at the same time. But I think that gives us some kind of a benchmark. And one of the papers that I wrote on that basis came to the conclusion that about 30 bucks per car wouldn't be a bad thing for, 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 uh, for up to 4G. I think with 5G, things become more interesting and potentially a lot more valuable um, because with cellular V2X, that could be a crucial enabler for um, autonomous driving. I mean, there are different schools of thought on that. I mean, a lot of implementations, a lot of development is actually trying to do fully autonomous without relying on cellular networks. And of course, the cellular networks are not going to have this capability everywhere, certainly not initially. Um, but I think it's most likely that um, cellular V2X will become prevailing, will prevail um, and will be part and parcel of what is required to have the highest levels of autonomous driving, full, uh, not Tesla's full self-driving, but a real high reliability uh, type of self-driving, which means that you can be asleep, literally asleep at the wheel. Um, it, it, that, um, and, and with that, then we can get colossal benefits that enable to reduce deaths, enable people to sleep in the car, to work in the car, and then we can look at valuing that on a, on a, on a, on a much, um, and we're already doing that on a much broader basis in terms of where the, the, the real 
total uh, economic value is being is is being delivered. Um, there are other aspects as well. Um, already, actually, with four G, um, the ability to have preventative maintenance, monitoring of automotive systems. That's value that you get in addition to what you could do on a handset. But just in summary, I'll say that broadly speaking, if you think of it in dollar terms, I think that it's quite reasonable to think the total dollar value in a car is about the same sort of order as what you get in a handset um, 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 already, but the potential is for it to go higher significantly. Yeah. So. Um... I mean, as an economist, we talked about, I think Kirti talked about this earlier. You know, I would like to maximize the, the uh, distribution of, of uh, standard-enabled products, and I would like to maximize the performance of the standard that's being created. So how do, we, how do we balance that, right? I mean, if you were only interested in interoperability, we could, we could say, what would the world be like if we had really just really cheap 2G uh, cellular service versus having... 3G, 4G, and now 5G. You can see how much value, how the pie is graded by creating more performance, right? Not just interoperability, but performance. I mean, when you have one standard, you automatically have interoperability. So um, the performance is critical. So how we need to incentivize increased performance, because that opens up all these possibilities like IoT and uh, the mobile economy. Um, I mean, we listened to Alex earlier today. He glows when he talks about price theory. So certainly we should follow that. And that means um, we should look for what customers are willing to pay. And that means that we should look at comparables. And comparables is obviously, in at least the US system, you know, it's Georgia Pacific one and two. There's probably one and two for a reason. We would like to see what other people have done. When things haven't been done yet, how do we set the prices? Well, that's gonna have to be with the negotiation of the players. You know better than others that it takes people to go back and forth to come up with something that's reasonable. That's the best way to figure out what people are willing to pay, um, is, to, is to let the market handle this. I don't think that, it, that, the, that the challenges of that have risen to the level that the government needs to step in and tell us how to do it. I, I think it's not perfect, but it's not, it's not a market failure. I mean, I'm an engineer. When, when I lear learned the economic definition of market failure, I'm like, oh, okay, that doesn't sound like failure. Because failure for me is like the bridge is in the, has fallen into the river, right? Not that a hypothetical problem with the bridge could possibly cause, yeah, it's not, yeah. So, um, so for me, I think we're a ways from away from that. I think we can have the actors work on this. The one thing that's interesting here is that you do have this value in use, right? And now with IoT, you have different use cases in different verticals, but you also have different use cases even within the car, for example, I mean, your, your license it was split a bit by, you had like e-call was a certain amount, and right? So, um, so what's going to happen here? I think that even the automotive industry was interested to say, well, we don't want to have to pay a large license if we're only going to use cellular for this use. But if they agree to that, then they have to also agree to what Keith said, which is that um, when, you can't, when a car doesn't function without connectivity, then when connectivity is the core function of the car, which is what you're going to have as you move into autonomous driving, then the royalties will have to go up because it's just as important as any other of the critical features. It's just not, it's not just an extra app, uh, navigation app and whatnot. So, and this slows us down, doesn't it? Because we don't know how people are going to use things. And if we want to value and use, we have to see how people use them. So we would like to get the negotiations done, but we would like to see how it's used. And this creates a bit of the the problem. We don't want holdout, but we need to wait a little bit to see what happens. So where is this line and how do we do that? That's that's how you make the that's why you make the big bucks. Uh, manage this. Yeah, I wish I made the big bucks. But you know, you, you guys have hit on two points that, that I think are spot on. Um, when it comes to the negotiations we have with the auto industry with 4G, the natural starting point is what we know about smartphone licensing. Mm -hmm. And you know, unsurprisingly, the car companies have a list of reasons why they should pay less than Apple and Samsung. And a lot of folks who own the technology have views as to why it's worth more in a car. And, and we've covered a lot of those reasons already. Um, what I think is going to be even tougher is when we get to those next applications you mentioned, mm -hmm. Bo, where there's not an obvious comp, even an adjacent comp. Right. 
but when it's the, you know, 5G has all sorts of different flavors, right? There's the full bandwidth, super low latency Cadillac version that will be used by cars and phones, but there's also Cat M, Cat NB IoT, which are aimed at getting the cost down, getting the battery life up, mm -hmm. right. and extending the range. And it's okay because they're gonna be in a smart meter or on uh, livestock or on a plant out in the field where they only need to send a little bits of data, in some mm -hmm. cases only if something's wrong. So when we get to licensing 5G technology there, you know, what starting points will we have in, right. in the industry to figure out you know, where do we go? In fact, when there's different options, right? You know, if someone says, well, I decided to put in 5G into my refrigerator instead of Wi-Fi, well, then, it, then it, it's telling them, it's saying that, well, this was more valuable. We made this decision. So when there's multiple options, you learn more. I mean, then, then you get this hedonic pricing that Greg was talking about. Then you get to, it reveals the price and the willingness to pay in relation to other alternatives. So in some ways, it's easier to do when there's competition. Ah. Interesting. Yeah, no, you're right, because you do see right now for the IoT, almost every IoT device in your home is going to be connected to your Wi-Fi network, right? right? That saves on the operator fees. It, it um, is typically cheaper hardware, right, that you put into your product. Um, and, and so it's something that's happening right now. There are competing standards and competing technologies available for these other applications that don't right. demand the super mobility and the super bandwidth. Uh, so how does that actually lead into an economic analysis uh, of the value? I mean, is it just a race to the bottom when you're seeing which, is, which can go cheaper between different standards, different technologies? Well, well I think that there's going to be, um, you know, when you have different options in the market, then they'll be priced in relation to competition, of course, so you have the willingness to pay this is what Alex showed before. There was a willingness to pay his big triangle on the top that was much higher on the demand curve than what people had to pay for a mobile phone in 2016. So when there's competition, of course, it drives down the price. Um, even though people would be willing to pay more, it creates more consumer surplus. And so I think that this consumer surplus is something that's left out of models. We have to include that in the value because that's also the value of the overall system. So competition will be good for consumers and it will also, um, allow us to differentiate what, what, um, what uh, technologies bring value to the customer. And then that value will be able to be much easier to recognize in the same way that when, when Apple sells a, um, a cellular enabled tablet for um, $200 more, they're, 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 even though it doesn't say what the market would be willing to pay for it, it tells you what they think it's worth. And that's, that's useful. Keith, Igor, anything to add on this valuation topic? I, I just think it's, it's vital and economically efficient that the license pricing, pricing can be at different levels for different applications. And, and it, we traditionally tend to think of it, well, you have a, a rate for 2G, a rate for 3G, a rate for 4G, and a rate for 5G. Um, and, and it kind of worked more or less. It's not entire, that's not 100% true, but it was more or less like that. I think we need to depart from that. And, and with 5G, I mean, 5G has lots of optional features. So uh, my 5G light bulb example, I mean, that wouldn't have the full suite of cellular V2X capabilities in it. And for that reason, um, and because of what you'd be doing in the light bulb, it, it makes no sense that, that there should be a uniform rate for the light bulb versus the autonomous vehicle. Um, and some people argue that there should be just one rate. And I think those that are doing that, they're just trying to get down to the lowest level. Um, you know, it, it would be, you know, if, if you're forced to have one rate for, for, for all applications, and you go in the middle somewhere, then it's never going to be econ economic to put, put 5G in the light bulb. Um, and you're going to be undercompensating, un undercompensated for putting it into a, a car. Um, that makes no economic sense to me. Actually, establishing what those rates should be is, 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 a, difficult, is a difficult task. Um, and the market, I think, will kind of figure it out. Um, uh, I mean, uh, over time, 
Um, but um, you know, we, we've just got to wait and see what those those price points are. But I, I think it would be very unhealthy for there to be an intervention to say that to enforce a sort of uniform pricing, just as it's a bad idea that DG Comp should be setting the price uh, overall. I didn't propose that, did I? No, oh, I, don't, I didn't hear you say that. No, no I suggested it. All right. That, <laughs> that was my rhetorical suggestion. <laughs> your, your, suge your suggestion was that uh, I think that the, the, they set up, um, uh, that they mandated something, um, a, a, an, an approach to licensing. I was the one who went one step further to, to say they should actually set the price. They didn't block. Yeah, yep. and Igor suggested the smoke. I, I didn't. I worked seriously, just in case anyone wants to quote me. And we're not under Chatham House rules. That was a joke. I do not. <laughs> I've already blogged it out there, Keith. Keith, uh, that's right. It's already tweeted out, Keith. You, you're too slow there. Yep. Well, I think it's a good time now, with a few minutes left, to open up to the uh, virtual attendance as well as the room, see if there are any questions before we wrap up on the different topics we discussed. Uh, is this on? Yeah, great. Um, so we're uh, at the exciting onset of, um, of deploying uh, 5G technology into new markets and uh, automotive is our first test case. And um, from my perspective, a lot of the conversation seems to be a repeat, like going back in time, like Bo was saying, back to like mid-2000s, these predictive hypotheses about how the sky is about to fall and uh, no one's, no licensor is going to want a license um, and so forth. What are you seeing in early indications? Because, uh, you know, a lot of the reporting is reporting a lot of transactions that are going on in automotive between the licensors and the uh, OEMs and, and arrangements being made for the tier one suppliers. So. It seems it's early days, but it seems more or less that the the market seems to be seems to be working stuff out. Um, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I agree with you, Jonathan. As usual, the um, the the sky is falling. I mean, it's a rhetoric, right? I mean, it's useful. It's a negotiation position. There's a lot of terms and concepts and things out there that are that are used as negotiation positions. So this is, this is part of the game, so it's just to be accepted. Um, you're right, there's a lot of stuff. I mean, my, I'm a big proponent that, that when people say, because there's a starting point that there's a problem that we need to solve, and I say, well, I, I don't think we've established there's a problem. Or at least we haven't established it past the distribution or circumstantial level to some type of systemic level that would require some type of government or private or, or public ordering. So um, I, I, I advocated that it sounds very simple and maybe kind of silly and naive, but if we just started by saying, instead of saying there's a market failure, how do we solve this market failure with this language? If we started, how do we improve on this market success? If we just reframed it that way. Wouldn't that be easier to get things better instead? Because when we sit in that world of market failures and all these sky is falling and there needs to be intervention, um, I, I don't think we actually get to something better for everyone. So I'm not sure how to solve that, but that, just that simple framing, that, that would make me very happy. And Jonathan, I'll take off my moderator cap for a second, give you a substantive answer. I think that the auto industry is in much better shape for 5G licensing compared to 4G. Mm -hmm. And the, the reason is, is there is now a knowledge and understanding of essential patents, of FRAN licensing, and all of the work that's gone into develop this technology and the fact that there is a cost that goes with it. Um, there's a couple reasons for that. You know, one is because when the original discussions amongst the car companies and their supply chain were happening, the folks in the room, nobody knew what a standard essential patent is, they probably weren't even thinking about patents, right? To them, there was nothing special about a telecommunications control unit as opposed to any other part of the car. And so they conducted supply negotiations in the same way they'd always done it with a standard IP indemnity clause and no extra thought given to what that meant in this situation. 
you know, it was a learning experience. It's been a learning experience for everybody the last few years with some of the litigation and a lot of the discussion. But, but the upshot of that is for the future, there is now a great understanding with the auto, within the auto industry of what this technology is and the need to plan for it. And so you won't see in the next uh, sourcing negotiations an IP indemnity given away by a tier one supplier to the OEM for no cost whatsoever. I mean, there will be thought put into that. There'll be a reservation on the bill of materials to say, if I'm going to commit to get licenses for my customer, I need to make sure I can pay for it and, and not put my business in the red because I didn't plan on licensing costs. So I think that's one reason, um, one big reason for optimism that we will have a much uh, smoother run with 5G and into the future. And, and it's just been a learning experience. Something to think about, right, as we, we say, hey, what can we learn from the auto industry as we look at other developments in the IoT is how can we educate folks better on the background of cellular technology, what went into it, and you know, the fact that even though it's easy to put into your products, there are extra, there is licensing that needs to be done around it and make it accessible and easy to do. Um, so, so something that we're thinking about a lot at our company is, is just getting that message out there, making sure that folks understand the amount of effort and energy that went into building this awesome technology that's changing our lives. I mean, I'm, a, I'm at conferences sometime where people, implementers, will say something like, well, 5G is just like a screw, you know, why should we? Or like, a two, like the plug. I'm like, oh, okay, that's a big gap in understanding, isn't it? You have, a, you have some work to do when you have that gap in understanding. Nothing like worldwide litigation, though, to, to, to narrow that gap. That's not the best way. That's not the cheapest way, for sure. Luke, can I ask you a question? Just to, to reverse the box. Yeah. Um, so do you, think, do you think the auto manufacturers are going to do a better job in extracting value from 5G? Um, I mean, I'll give you an example where, I mean, I think to some extent, the, the, the implementation of connectivity in cars so far has been kind of mixed. Um, and so for example, um, I have a you know, reasonably uh, a good quality car, let's say, with a nav system, which I never use. Um, what I have is I have my uh, Samsung Galaxy smartphone on a cradle on the dashboard and I use that because I find the, the, the nav experience, it, 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 it's just not good in the car. Um, I can't put the addresses in effectively and such like, so I don't use it. I paid a lot of money for that capability, but it, it's not been implemented very well. Do you think the auto manufacturers are going to kind of transform things? So my default, I wouldn't, when I'm in my car, I wouldn't dream of trying to use my cell phone to navigate, for example. So, so the short answer is yes, absolutely. The, and there's a couple of reasons I say that. First of all, Tesla has shown everybody the way. Um, I remember the first time I got into a Tesla with the big screen and saw what the connectivity did, can do. Uh, it, it really opened my mind to what was possible. And I think it did the rest of the industry. They're not a very fast moving industry. You know, models are planned, locked in years in advance, but they are getting there now. I don't know if you've been in the most recent Mercedes. They have a window to window dashboard that is one big screen and it is really cool. Uh, so yes, I, I think it will. The, the other reason I say it is because of what 5G uh, has done specifically for the auto industry. You know, they're involved now around the 3GPP. They've created their own group, the 5G Automobile Association, in, in conjunction with the Qualcomm's and Ericsson's and Nokia's of the world. Sounds and there's, like an LNG. <laughs> And there, there, is, there is a real effort to develop features into 5G that are the building blocks for cool killer apps in the car. I mean, the, the three that I know of specifically off the top of my head, uh, one is called V2X technology. The idea that you can lower the latency of your communication by communicating directly from one car to the car that's next to it on the road, rather than having to go through the network and back to the other car. So you can have real-time communication and then just the safety uh, applications of that, right? If you break and the car behind you knows to break as well, are pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, a second thing that is going on with 5G is the enhanced positioning. Mm -hmm. 
So instead of whatever a 4G cell phone can do and identify your positioning down to 10 feet, that's not very helpful when you're trying to navigate a highway. But if you can get it down to an inch or so, then that really helps the car and, and you can build applications when you know precisely where the car is in the lane. Well, I think you're describing how, perform how the increased performance adds value, right? I, it's not I, just interoperability, it's performance. And no, that's right, for sure. And then the third one is just the enhanced reliability, right. right? If your car is relying on a cell phone network and it could go out you know, three times on the drive from work to, to, uh, to home, that's not good for a self-driving car or right. somewhere where it's depending on it. But increasing the reliability is another big thing that I think will let 5G really, really be transformational in the auto industry. There would be no more autom autonomous driving, there would be no more um, gridlock then, right? Because that's a human phenomenon, isn't it? <laughs> it, you, you would hope starting so. and stopping now when everyone knows we won't have that yeah anymore. well and routing cars through the intersection at just the right time when no one's coming the other direction I mean there's the people have all sorts of great ideas it's it's been a really fun space to be involved in talking with all the folks both at the uh, the wireless companies who are building making the building blocks as well as the car companies who are thinking about what to do with them it, it's a really cool synergy right now and lots of great ideas cool they said, they said building highways would eliminate traffic congestion. That didn't work out, did it? I think the, the fact of the matter is, I mean, it's good and valuable, but you make something that's useful, people want to do more of it. So I, I think it, we're probably going to continue to have traffic congestion. I think that's just unavoidable. Keith, as I vote, you know, we were sitting here looking at each other. Luke and I were very happy with what we what was just discussed. We were at it. And then the voice behind me just kind of said, no, that's not going to happen. <laughs> well, thank you for that, Keith. We had a little utopian moment there. You took it away. All right. Well, I think we have used our time up uh, for this afternoon. But thank you guys for paying attention and uh, great discussing these topics with you. Thanks, Luke.